everyone. <laughs> Thanks to Fiona and the organisers. It's it's been great to. Let me know if I need to speak up as well. Um, but thanks to Fiona and the organisers for this chance to just uh, have a bit of an off-the-cuff conversation. Um, I'm Daniel Bangert. I'm the scholarly communications librarian at the University of New South Wales. I uh, work there on issues of open access, helping to support the institutional's, institution's policy around that, as well as uh, tools and skills for digital scholarship. Um, as many in the GLAM sector, I guess this is probably a, a common experience, but we come to it with different backgrounds. It's often a, a second or third career, and um, I've come from it uh, from classical music performance uh, as a violinist, and then moved into musicology as an academic doing research and teaching. Um, my career in libraries has been around digital repositories and research data management um, prior to scholarly communications. Um, so with that background in mind, hopefully this talk will make a bit more sense. Um, but it's trying to bring together a number of my passions, I guess. This is very much a, a labour of love. It's been put together on the side as a side project. I'm not talking about this as a, as a UNSW or, or UNSW library project. This is just my own a personal thing in collaboration with others. Um, and it's been done without funding. It's been done with open source tools and bits of string and things like that. So um, <laughs> any, any feedback is welcome and also help or assistance if you're interested. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a project which is called uh, Jazz Cats. Um, so there will be jazz and there will be cats. So I'll start with this, this picture here. Um, and we do have a, a website, it's um, jazzcats.oerc.oxac.uk. So it's sitting in the University of Oxford. Um, the story behind this is that in my academic research, I'm interested in, in the idea of performance history, how music performance changes over time, why performance of piece X is different night after night or different 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, so when we were thinking about this and coming from that data curation um, angle, I realised that there is, there's this great data out there um, in the form of discographies that trace recorded histories of music over time. Um, they're put together by experts very lovingly, but unfortunately they're either at the end of books or they exist in PDFs, as Fiona was talking about. Um, not machine readable, not accessible really at all. So I started to think about how can we integrate some of that information, um, how recordings, uh, who's on those recordings, so starting with the metadata for instance, uh, but music's an interesting case because if you can go beyond that you can also extract um, really interesting um, information about the music itself, sort of how the tones are put together, other performance features. So. Jazz Cats is a, is a prototype project. Um, what we've done is to integrate three different data sets um, and release them openly as, as linked open data. So that's just a, a method of publishing on, on the web, which I can go into, but possibly don't need to. Um, the people involved, one of the things we need to do is update our website, but um, to date. <laughs> so do you want to help with that? <laughs> Um, Terry Numekufula at uh, ANU in the Centre for Digital Humanities, um, Alfie Abdul -Ram Rahman at uh, University of Oxford, and there, there are a few others as well, um, putting in our spare time on this project. So I'll just explain quickly the three data sets and then how you can access this data and, and maybe what our future plans are. So the, the three data sets we've got. Um, uh, a recorded history of uh, body and soul, the jazz standard. So this is every recording um, that a scholar could uh, get a hold of, um, all the performance metadata uh, about those recordings. We've also got a, a database uh, of transcribed jazz solos. Um, so again, extensively human curated. And then another resource, which is already linked open data, which is uh, called Linked Jazz, 
which you may have heard of, uh, but it's about the networks between musicians. And there's a crowdsourcing aspect to this as well as um, they put up oral histories in the form of transcripts and then you can go in and code the relationships between them. So if two people are talking about playing together in a session, then you can describe that uh, as you know, playing together or knows this person. So you, you end up with quite a rich resource. So these were accessible um, via uh, CSV files in the form of, in the case of the discography, in the case of the jazz solos, that was a SQL light um, relational database, and then of course uh, the linked data resource. So. Uh, one of the things that we did first is work on the data structures using ontologies that would make sense to actually integrate these together. I won't go into too much detail, but you can see some definitions. We also tried to link to external resources uh, like the BBC Music, which has released a lot of its data uh, openly as, as LOD. Um, some library authorities, uh, Music Brain, which is an early linked data resource as well. So what we have at the moment is um, a triple store. Basically, it's uh, all of our data described as linked data in the form of triples. And it's got this beautiful UI, which you can, you can search uh, using Sparkle uh, query language. And, and we plan to, to have some um, visualizations and other tools on top of this, but at the moment that's, that's the status of the project. So just to sum up, um, what we've created is, is a enriched data source that integrates three different data sets as a prototype. So instead of just seeing um, the recorded history of one piece of music, you can then ask, what about um, give me all the performers um, that knew another performer and recorded this piece in the key of something, something else. So you can build queries that are much more complex than you could originally just with one data set. So this is an example uh, which I can just run for you, which is yeah, trumpet players that made a recording of piece X, body and soul, with a pianist and performed in the key of D flat. And if it doesn't break, it will run. Yes, OK, so you end up with three names. Um, OK, so I guess that's all I have, but happy to take questions, um, get some feedback. Feel free to talk to me. And we're looking for you know, interest and assistance as well. So thank you. I will just mirror the display. Drag and drop in.
Well, has it tanning? So um, I'm in um, in my spare time. I'm involved in the uh, Music Brains community. Um, it's a huge database of artists, releases, um, works, all the metadata that you want. So um, it's it's sort of it's been going for for years and um, it's built around um, all the data is licensed under CC0. Um, there's a few bits that are uh, under another Creative Commons, but most of it's pretty much public domain. Um, it's got a API to search th things. Um, it's an API. Um, and most of my use has been um, just tagging my own music. So um, my CD Ripper um, looks up the Music Brain web surface, uh, pulls in the tags. Um, so uh, yeah, I've added hundreds of artists and hundreds of recordings to it. Um, so some of the good things that it, it does is it uh, there's a whole lot more metadata than does you want that that you can keep on adding. Um, so here's uh, Daft Punk. You get the Twitter account. Um, you get links to other things. Um, probably the one of the other more useful ones is um, Wikidata. So if you haven't heard, um, Wikidata is a database built behind Wikipedia for storing some of this other metadata. Um, with Wikidata, um, you get language, uh, the Wikipedia page for each language. There's also um, people can have add more data, so it's sort of more freeform in how they add their data. So if I just, if I can find the, let's go down to the Wikidata link. Yeah, there, yeah. there are musical duo, Daft Punk's musical duo, links to uh, Wikimedia Commons when they started, some genre tags, um, the labels and things like that. So if you can't find data in Music Brains, start um, searching some of the extra um, associated databases. Um, so yeah, um, that's where most of my extra ads have gone. So once I've added all the artists that I care about, I then start Google searching and making, keeping music brains and weird data up to date with small random facts. Um, uh, the piece of, if you're gonna use this at home, um, You would um, download a, um, their tag of software, which is called uh, Music Brains Picard. Um, you drag and drop your MP3 files or FLAC files in there. Um, it should automatically search the database and do some fingerprint to detect it, hopefully. Um, and it can sort of guess from some of the tags to find the correct entry. Um, there is cover art. Um, that Cover art is provided by archive.org. We've got a collaboration with them, so you can up, go to our website, upload the cover art, they'll store it on their servers, and if there's a copyright dispute, they'll deal with that, so we don't have to. <laughs> um, what else? Um, so it, there's, um, it's sort of um, built around um, adding more detail to items as you go. So um, uh, there's random access memories. It's got each version of the 
um, CD, so sometimes CDs in another country will have different track lists. So this keeps tra track of that and will have different barcodes and potentially different cover art. Um, I go and pick one of these. If I can find it on the, get my mouse there. Um, you then, you then uh, get a whole lot, can add more details. So on this we've got who played the synthesizer, who played the guitars, um, who wrote the song, and all that stuff. So that should all, all be linked. Um, every artist has a unique ID um, to deal with name conflicts. So there can be 10 people with the same name. And as long as you can find, track down which the ID should be, they can all have a unique entry. Um, so, so there's a whole release group, which is any v instance of this, then you'll have a releases, which is this on CD, this on vinyl, this on in Australia. Uh, you've got tracks and recordings, and you can see if this song's on multiple compilations and find that sort of metadata. Um, I don't know. So if, if you've got, if you're dealing with music, I recommend uh, using a web service for looking up more info. Okay. One, two. Yeah, it's working. Image, uh, okay. Are you outputting something, Nick? Do you know? Yeah. I'm just going to hold it because okay. I need to share it with you. Okay. Um, this is a project um, we thought we'd take an opportunity to share, which Hugh and I created um, in 2016 for GovHack. Um, it takes um, collections from the National Portrait Gallery, um, the National Library, and also um, from, uh, from National Archives, National Archives um, articles from Trove. Um, and again, builds on some work that was done by Tim Sherratt. Um, again, going through those declassified uh, ASIO documents that Don, uh, Bonnie talked about um, and where the, the redaction art critters came from. There are also a lot of uh, surveillance photos in this collection of um, individuals who were, were under surveillance. And so we started um, putting together um, articles from Trove with these surveillance photos, um, but also portraits from the National Portrait Gallery um, to look at the kind of the, um, the public and the, uh, and the secret um, 
faces of the um, of the civil rights movement in Australia, um, particularly um, surveillance of the Communist Party. We did. Um, so I actually had this as my um, Twitter header for a little while. Uh, <laughs> so we found things like this. This is um, an Australian Communist Party poster that was uh, up for a little while saying that ASIO was the real security risk. So that was um, a nice little uh, um, attempt to spin their own, um, you know, they obviously knew that ASIO was was uh, looking at them. They, um, uh, they didn't, ASIO didn't really make too much of a secret of it. Um, one of my favourite um, things that we found here is, uh, just a moment. Where was it? Oh, I think it was actually on the home page. Hang on. Yes, secret meetings. So what we did is we we um, looked at all these images um, and started putting them into an, an Amica instance um, because that was, you know, fairly simple and <laughs> an easy way to kind of curate everything. Yeah, a nice um, piece of free and open source software which could be a nice piece of free and open source software, which could be customised to our needs uh, using Dublin Core metadata standard. Yes. Um, and then what we did is we basically, generally our approach was to sort of download a couple of folders of um, Tim's photos that he'd conveniently sort of <laughs> batched together for us <laughs> in GitHub and then Oh, we just sort of went through the photos until we found something that looked kind of interesting uh, and then um, tried to find records that, that sort of had matching data. So we looked at the meta, there wasn't a lot of metadata on most of these photos, but there was a bit. And then using that metadata, we then would look in Trove um, and in a couple of other places to see if we could find anything out. And um, I discovered something quite interesting here and turned it into a little, um, Things. So, on the weekend of the 2nd and 3rd of September 1967, ASIO was taking photos of people who were going to the Eureka Youth League National Congress, which was basically the youth arm of the Communist Party. Um, and on the same weekend, the Canberra Times published two articles. Um, one was about the Liberal Party's Federal Council meeting at the Hotel Canberra, and the other one was about the Ainsley Boy Scouts meeting. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, well, that's like not particularly interesting to you, but um, let's let's see what they said. So this is the Eureka League National Congress, and um, so basically, as you just had a photographer sitting outside the building, photographing everybody who went in, and they all kind of look like this. They they all look very stylish, actually. <laughs> I think. Um, so that's that. Uh, now, the thing I find particularly amusing about this news article is that it's called More Faceless Men, but it's actually about the Liberal Party. <laughs> um, and this was a complaint that the Liberal Party executive were meeting in this hotel in Canberra and deciding things about Australian government policy and there were no journalists there and it wasn't open and there was no scrutiny and it was outrageous. It was this secret meeting that the, the Liberal Party executive were having. Um, and on the very same day, the Ainsley Boy Scouts were having a meeting at the Girl Guide Hall because their hall had been burnt down. And I note that this was also a private meeting. <laughs> so the public weren't allowed in to the Ainsley Girl Guides Hall whilst the Boy Scouts were there. So it was, I, I just kind of found that amusing that there was these newspaper articles about these two meetings um, where decisions were being made and they were very secret and at the, at the same time ASIO was photographing um, the Eureka Youth League um, secretly <laughs> and um, speculating on all of the dastardly things that they were doing in their meeting. Uh, one last thing 
um, I'd like to share is um, um, the academic and activist Gary Foley. Um, there are, he's obviously requested his ASIO file because there are a number of photos um, of him available. Um, but interestingly, he's um, crossed, crossed the line because, as I mentioned at the beginning, we also had um, resources from the National Portrait Gallery that there's um, uh, Foley is unusual um, in the collection in that he's someone who appears both in the surveillance um, images but um, has also now has a, a portrait in the National Portrait Gallery collection. So, you know, as someone who's been, um, you know, an activist of a person of interest to ASIO, um, we also recognise the significant contribution that he's made to Australian life. So, yeah, that was just um, a little piece showing what can be done in a weekend with some open glam um, collections. <laughs> Worry about looking at stuff. Um, so there were, um, I did mention sort of doing a, a, a sort of case study of what we looked at with Tim's. My pockets aren't working. There we go, okay. Um, um, of that, of that redaction art um, case study and, and looking at how um, glam institutions can sort of, um, I mean, not take that and then apply it, but sort of ask themselves some questions around, around that and maybe what could we look to do or what could we think about doing. Um, and there are a few elements. So one of the first things was interfaces. Um, who's used their library interface? Yeah, and is it terrible? No, not Hughes. Hughes is amazing. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's sort of that truth universally acknowledged that library database catalogues can be a bit shit um, and they can be a bit difficult to wrangle. So from Tim's example, what he did was actually take those images and he created a data visualisation or a generous interface, right? And so we go from mitigating access via the search box that demands the user ask a question, right? So to, to, to in, in a traditional catalogue, we have to know what we're looking for to get the answer, and we have to know that that answer's in there, right? And it's, it's a mitigated access. Whereas if you present everything, right, nice and generous, you give the possibility of every answer. So what we had was that, that flipping of access. Um, and we also had the... Um, privileging, I guess, of the digital object over the institutional record. So again, the point of access becomes the digital object, not the record that's been created that then leads into the object. So there's some things for us to take away there. Um, now, personally, me, I would just talk to my open source um, provider and say, I want this to be in my library catalogue, or this is what I want, or when I deal with vendors, I would say, this is a priority for me and this is what I want to do. Um, but I'm not a library manager, so things are different, I guess. Um, it, but but I'm, I'm quite realistic about the fact that we do have to work with what we've got um, and that change can be slow and it's resource intensive and money and all those kind of things. So a really um, obvious thing to me would be to invite the hack, right? Like we're dealing with this library catalogue system or this um, content management system and it doesn't do everything we want but there are people out there who can make it do what we want so why don't we invite the hack why don't we share the code they create why don't we invite them into our institutions if we can't do it ourselves why aren't we collaborating with the community a bit more um, and it, I think it's really important to acknowledge that all of us who engaged with redaction art and those of you in this room who will go on to um, engage with redaction art <laughs> tonight are likely to do so or almost, I can't imagine that you won't access it outside of the National Archives, right? Like you're going to engage with it outside of the National Archives record search database, outside of the National Archives database 
a website and outside of the physical building. Now, institutions, we might say we're okay with that and take a passive stance. And I'm not giving an answer one way or the other, but it's, it's something to, um, I think, institutions to consider if they're going to, what stance they're going to take around that. Um, the other thing that we had in this case study was a u unifying hashtag, right? We were all able to participate today. You can search that hashtag on Twitter and see it from the very beginning through, okay? Um, so that enabled linking. It enabled the creators. It enabled the contributors. And it enabled the curious to all get linked up together, right? Um, so. It wouldn't be, I think institutions need to look at um, having a, a hashtag or some sort of communicative tool that links makers with their collections and which enables them to shout their achievements in a really acceptable way. Like social media is built for social interaction, like humans like to be seen as knowing things. And so when an institution likes or retweets you, that is the absolute equivalent of the teacher putting a gold star <laughs> next to your name on the board of public awesomeness. Like it's not hard. And I think we could take, I don't know, I never re really thought that a retweet or a like would be a risk. Um, yet when we look at our um, social interaction today, I want you to think about how many institutions have actually gotten back to us. And I know we joked about the committee. I mean, they're still in the meeting. <laughs> um, gotten back to us. Try to have gotten back to us. But the, so there's those kind of things. And I think the, the last point, because I will wrap it up, because we are all, um, I mean, today's been fab, hasn't it? Hasn't today just been so fab? Um, but we need to think about and, and it touches, Donna, on what you were talking about here and what we were all talking about around what gets accessed. And it's to do with how we present the information, right? So libraries and archives and GLAM in general, we produce exhibitions all the time, don't we? Right? We curate some content, we put some context around it, we put some displays up, we invite you to come and have a look. Um, one thing that would be, I think, really useful is to, you know, when, when, when researchers and scholars publish, we ask them to deposit the accompanying data, right? So when we create an exhibition, we should have an accompanying data set that goes with it. And um, we don't put it behind a crappy interface, right? We don't do that. Don't do that. Because again, you're mitigating access via that search box. So we give it to, the, we just give it to people. We just be really generous and we say, here's the data, right? Because libraries are really good, can be good, at, and this is a negative. Oh, um, we need to be careful and we need to think about the way that we present stories to people and whether we are providing a sanctioned narrative, like an approved narrative. I think often we are following that line, and again, it comes back to risk, it comes down back to who funds us, it comes back to us keeping our jobs, right? Um, but I think if you allow for the opportunity of other histories to emerge in conversation with the sanctioned narrative, and those histories may be uncomfortable. And I want them to be uncomfortable, frankly. Um, but I think that you can have your safe exhibition that gets the ticks from the powers that be. You release the data associated with that as a data set for people to then take it upon themselves to find those other voices amongst that sanctioned history. Does that make sense? And that sounds really easy to me. That sounds um, like a really nice compromise by what we have to do and, and what potential is there. So um, I would sort of take those takeaways away from that redaction art case study. It's not prescriptive, it's not what I'm selling institutions to do, but I think it's um, questions we can be asking ourselves. It really um, needs to be that critical engagement with what we do and the reasons that are behind it and those um, <laughs> critically examining the decisions we make because we're, we're people making decisions about what gets acted 
what gets digitised, what is accessible, how it is accessible and the issues surrounding that. So a little more, bit more critical engagement around what we do I think is necessary. Anyway, I think that's it. Are there any questions? No? Good? I think everyone's brain is full. <laughs> I know, I know. It's good though, that's what you wanted at an end of the day like this. How fab has it been? Oh, I love you all so much. <laughs> Let's do this again. Beautiful. Yes. I have one question, which mm. is, so uh, you're talking about being an institution engaging with people, so as a person wanting to engage with that conversation mm. with mm. an institution, mm. are you the edge that I come to? to ah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> who? Yeah, who? Yeah. Um, oh, these are broader questions about our profession that... Um, Look, I think, again, what I wanted to sort of do with that talk today was to initiate um, conversation with the institutions and see how they came through. Um, we also have a professional body, um, but then there are individuals who are active. So, you know, library Twitter is super generous and super loud and Hugh, I'm sure, has a few names that he would recommend for, for in that area, that arena, being at the forefront. Because we have another hat on, which is we're yeah. technically a library at the Open Australia Foundation. Yeah, as okay. Well, although we're not an official. Right, an unofficial, unofficial library. library. Oh, so. <laughs> we like we're, that. We were endorsed as a charity, as a library. Yeah, so okay. That, that is uh, what we are. They don't, they don't really yeah. <laughs> I found that. Yay. <laughs> don't need it anymore, but I still think of us that way. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Yes. So. May, can we continue the conversation and make some of those connections at Vala in about less than a month? Like, is that a I, I think I think for Vala, yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I am so envious of um, people who will be at Vala, but I think this is definitely where that conversation should be heading. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're already dealing with... Um, and I, I, we won't go t into the culture of libraries too much. I don't know if we have to, but at Vala you will be dealing with people who already have the mindset to be yeah. grasping this. Yeah. So yes. yes. So yes. yes. So take yeah. that, and and take that, take that offline. Well I was about to say offline, but let's take that online to Twitter. Yes. <laughs> to library Twitter. <laughs> to library Twitter. Um, and maybe we need a hashtag. <laughs> um, but but yeah definitely like I would love to see what comes out of that. Yes. Yeah. Just a comment on the power of library Twitter. A school friend has found me on Twitter today because of... <laughs> <laughs> Bringing people she's, together. She's now a librarian. Oh, excellent. That has an excellent story. Yes. I also, this is a kind of a conversation that I've been having with Sarah. Mm. And I saw, we sort of looped in... Um, we lived in Clinton today, and mm. I haven't actually. I've sort of had different conversations with you <laughs> about. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Those who know me know that's what I do. Yeah. Um, that we should have a dedicated open source and library slash glam yes. event. Yes. 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 Where yes. we where, where we bring. This is it. Yeah. But the thing is, we're at LCA, and yeah. we're only, we didn't get many people from libraries. Yeah. Mm. And we learned mm. that about the in the education mini comps. We had education mini comps, and when eventually when teachers just aren't coming, mm. and it's the same here. It's like for librarians and and glam professionals to come to this is going to be a stretch. What mm. we need to do is go to their existing events, but yeah. also create something which is. Yeah about that intersection yeah. and that's why I'm looking at you and yeah. you and you know yeah that's what we that's the way we need to do it yeah you're absolutely I mean I'm I, I'm astonished that we don't have a room full of library leaders here the, 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 the argument to come though like, yeah you know, I know how do you push that forward to the powers that be that yeah like I get it yeah absolutely absolutely it's harder to communicate yeah. In the abstract. Yeah. Now, next year, of course, it'll be different. Totally stuff. different. Are you kidding? Yeah. BuzzFeed was all over yeah, this. Right. Oh, my <laughs> God. I think you would get more here if you promoted the mini-conf as a standalone thing mm -hmm. within the context of the Avengers Con. And it certainly wasn't clear to me until I approached you, Sarah, uh, was that, you know, a day ticket was available. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Absolutely. Yeah, no. Ab absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now that there's interest, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think we've got a really animated online conversation happening right now. I think that will continue with those at Vala. Um, and then once we sort of uh, create a little branch within Alia, it's going to be fine. It's going to be great. Exactly. Excellent. Well, domination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got Yay. Here is done. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. So over to the organisers. <laughs> Sorry, I might just have to stand beside you. I'm tired. Oh, there we go. Oh, the secret pockets. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, that was that was some fantastic um, summarising and conversation, and I think we have um, started something. This is the start of something bigger, I hope. Um, Sarah and Clinton, thank you so much for for letting me join your um, your your mini conf. Um, yeah, I think that we really have explored those intersections um, that I said at the at the beginning of the day that I hoped we would we would get to look at, um, and shown that there is a lot of value in the conversation between open source and open glam. So yeah, thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> yeah. And please come next year if it's on. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully, it, it always, hopefully. Yeah. fingers crossed. It's always an Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> Take that off your hands. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>